Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay, just testing the microphone. Good. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to Boston Basic Income. I'm Alex Howlett. Um, today we have a very special guest, uh, Carl Weiderquist. Um, he is a philosophy professor over at uh, Georgetown University, Qatar. He has a PhD in economics from uh, City University of New York and a PhD in uh, political theory, I think, from Oxford University. Uh, and beyond that, uh, he's been a basic income supporter for over 40 years, uh, and he's been writing about it for about 30 years. Uh, 20 years. 20 a little years. over 20 years. A little 22. over 20 years. Uh, yeah, um, and he's written a lot of books and articles about basic income, uh, and he's here to give us a, a lecture about the history of the basic income movement. Uh, so uh, I'll let Carl take it away. Uh, afterwards, we can ask questions, uh, including uh, people on the live stream. Okay, take it away, Carl. Thank you. Basic income is taking off right now in popularity, not just in the United States, but around the world. Noticeably, over the last 10 years, if you were following it, uh, uh, it's been really an exponential growth throughout the past decade, even in the, in the, in the past year, it's been, it's been stronger yet. Uh, with more and more people finding out about it and hearing about it and talking and it suddenly it's burst onto the national dialogue and the presidential debate. Lots of people that didn't know what basic income was a year ago are now working uh, diligently to push this idea. There's a basic income caucus for uh, in, in the congressional races uh, getting behind it. There are people around the world on all six inhabited continents marching for it a few months ago. And it seems to me, uh, so it, it can seem to many people that this idea just appeared out of nowhere. And a, a quite the opposite. This is a very old idea that's been formulating for a long time and has had three distinct waves of support throughout the last century that I want to discuss the history of basic income, the three waves of support that it's had, and how we are now in the third, the largest and the most international wave of support that basic income has ever had, which tells us really nothing about where it's going. Uh, um, so we really don't know what's going to happen first. Now, uh, so what I'm going to what I'm going to explain to you today is that uh, there's a long history, really going back to ancient history or prehistory, but uh, the first wave of support happened around in that time between about the late teens and the early 1940s, but it was a very disconnected wave with people who uh, weren't talking to each other, just happened to be hitting on similar ideas at the same time. Then in the late 1960s, 60s and early 1970s, there was another and much more substantial wave of support where people actually began to learn what each other was doing and it actually made more inroads in politics than it had previously. And that was all dead by about 1980, at least in the United States. And we went into another down period that lasted for perhaps 30 years between 1980 and around and uh, around 2010, 2012, depending on how you're going to score it, uh, which was unfortunate for me because I learned about basic income on February 7th, 1980, right when, <laughs> right when the second wave was dying down and I had to live through this period. Uh, and then, I, but, but I got to watch this period and, and, and it was really exciting. I was like, wow, why did, how did that happen? Why did that happen? And uh, so I'm struggling to understand this, this history and where, how we can build on what's happened so far and what's going on with this history. So, Let's go back to let's go back to ancient times. There is there it's really hard to credit anyone with inventing the idea of basic income. There are a bunch of people who reinvented it without the knowledge of people who in, had invented the idea before. Um, in prehistory and actually in large parts of recorded history we didn't have a monetary economy and we couldn't have a basic income because basic income is defined as a cash income 
paid to every citizen or every resident of a community on an individual basis without means test and without work requirements. It goes to everyone unconditionally within some zone or to some polity. It being a cash income means if you don't have a substantial cash economy, you don't get it. It just simply can't exist. Now, however, Many traditional economies had something else. They did not have universal access to cash, universal cash, but they had unconditional, universal access to common land and common resources where they could, if it was a hunting and gathering community, they could hunt, gather, fish, or farm. Uh, uh, hunt, uh, hunt, gather, fish, or scavenge. And if it was a farming community, they could farm the land, use it for pasturage, or uh, many farming communities actually had, had substantial, uh, what they would call a waste, which is really just a commons used for foraging. These are unconditional, universal ways that a person can meet their needs with direct access to resources. They can meet their own needs without having to do what more privileged people tell them to do. They do not have to follow orders to survive. The commons was closed gradually over a long period of time. It began with the earliest states uh, before recorded history thousands of years ago. And it really is not quite complete today as there are still a few people living in foraging communities or traditional communities in Africa, in New Guinea, in Borneo, in uh, the parts of the Amazon that uh, the president of Brazil hasn't burned down. Um, there, are, there are a few people living this sort of lifestyle today, but the, the enclosure movement in Europe and the colonial movement outside of Europe, these twin movements happening about the same time, from 1500 till about the present, took land that was traditionally a common and made it the private property of wealthy, privileged individuals and said to everyone else, so they took the resources and they gave it to all the privileged people, whether it was a Soviet administrator or a capitalist owner, it was some privileged group of people and they said to everyone else, the vast majority of the human population, you can't get access to the resources you need to survive unless you do what you're told. You get a job, you work for, but of course get a job sounds great, we're all gonna help each other, but it's actually those without property taking orders from those with privileges to decide what happens with the Earth's resources. Taking orders, so it's a less privilege, taking orders from the privilege or facing starvation, homelessness, eating other people's garbage or whatever else happens to people who are in abject poverty. That condition is created. It's not a natural condition. Poverty, homelessness is not everyone's starting point. Natural starting point. The natural starting point for any animal is to use the resources of the earth to keep themselves alive. There are no, there are no apes or wolves uh, or deer who have to ask permission of a more privileged ape or wolf or deer to use the commons to keep themselves alive. Only humans have this condition and only humans living since the enclosure and the, and the, uh, the colonial movement. So for many years, many traditional communities had something very much like a basic income. They had direct access to the commons and something else as well. Many, if not most traditional communities, whether it was a farming community, or a hunting and gathering community had a system where if you didn't have enough, other people would share with you. So that's sort of like another form of basic income. Um, and so they didn't need it. So the first, but uh, once you start moving into cash economies where this traditional thing is not possible, um, you get some things like uh, a basic income coming and going here and there. The oldest example I know of is the uh, is the Athens mines. Uh, the the city state of Athens in ancient times owned mines as a city, um, and they took the revenue from those mines and they distributed it to all the citizens of Athens. 
essentially that was a basic income. Well, it sounds like a basic income anyway. It's for every citizen, every member of a political community, and it's in cash and so forth and so on. Um, it wasn't conditional on work or it meeting any other requirements. In that sense, it was a basic income in ancient Athens. However, it was only for citizens, and only about 10% of Athens was a citizen. Uh, women weren't citizens, uh, uh, slaves were not citizens, and they had a whole bunch of free laborers who weren't citizens, uh, and none of these people got access to the money from the mines, not to mention the mines were being worked by slaves. So actually, it was not a basic income at all. But it was something like a basic income for the citizens, and it has kind of a sad history, too, because uh, they... Uh, they, at one time, when they were threatened by the Persian Empire, uh, they decided to divert some of this money into building up their navy, uh, which was apparently instrumental to protecting themselves from the Persian Empire. But actually, it's so, uh, uh, so it had some good effects as the version of their sort of basic like thing they had, but then it, uh, uh, so it helped them defend themselves against Persia, but then also after that it helped them create an empire where they were able to enslave a bunch of other Greeks. So uh, uh, definitely a mixed decision from getting rid of this basic income. Now, um, the first, uh, the first statement of, uh, well, some of the, one of the earliest statements of something like a basic income, and a person who is often given credit for starting the basic income movement, is Thomas Paine, writing in his pamphlet, Agrarian Justice, in, I th in the 1790s. Now, and that was very close to, but not quite, a basic income. Thomas Paine's, well, uh, Thomas Paine's pamphlet. Uh, what he and he talked about the very same things that I've been talking about: the closure of the commons, and how people have never been compensated for the closure of the commons, and because of that, they are forced to work for. Uh, they are forced to work for other people, and so it makes them unfree, and they've never been compensated, so they need compensation in some form which will restore some of that freedom. What he proposed was a very large chunk of money when people came of age, I think at age 20, and then a citizen's pension from age 55 until death. That would be for everyone. That was the that from 55 to death was more like a basic income. But the idea, he said, of the of the uh, of the large sum given to them when they came of age was that they could buy a farm and then they wouldn't have to work for other people. So it was a form of direct access to resources, restoring. So he was looking at restoring that direct access to resources rather than compensating people in cash. So it wasn't a true basic income. Uh, proposal, but it was something along those lines for some of the very reasons that basic income supporters think this is so important today. Someone who read that pamphlet, Thomas Spence, a much less well-known figure, came up with, in response, he's saying, this is a great idea, doesn't go far enough, we need something that goes a little farther. Thomas Spence wrote the first proposal for a true basic income about a year after agrarian justice. Uh, another man named Thomas Charlier, who was, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, which I might not be, who was a Belgian and a follower of uh, the famous yet probably insane philosopher uh, Charles Fourier, um, uh, he actually reinvented basic income in the 1840s. Um, Henry George, who was very much a, a painist, uh, who was very concerned about land value and how access to the land is being, being or has been taken away from most people and they've never been compensated for that and how doing that causes poverty because people are always in that position where they have to work and their work ends up, benefit, ends up making land more valuable. But they, uh, but since they always have to, work, then since none of that is shared with them, they always end up getting the lesser amount. He was concerned more with compensating people for the compensating people for the loss rather than restoring the freedom, compensating them and compensating them often with government services. But he did mention at one point in his voluminous writings, well, if you have some money left over after all of these, all of the government services, 
you could distribute that in a dividend to everyone, and that essentially is a basic income. So he kind of mentioned it in a little way. And Henry George, even though he's not well remembered uh, today, aside from his uh, his his remaining supporters, which are he has a, a sizable cult following even to this day, but he's not well remembered outside of that, um, was a very important popular writer at the time. He had, uh, his book, Progress and Poverty, was for many decades, was the best selling book in economics ever. I'm, I'm sure it's been surpassed since, but it was for a very long time the best selling book in the field of economics. Uh, then, and that was, that brings us into the first wave in basic income. So around 1920, you get a bunch of different people hitting on the same idea at the same time. You get Bertrand Russell, who wrote a quote I almost know exactly, which is, a certain small income, sufficient for necessaries, should be given to every member of the community, whether they work or not. And then a larger income shall be given to those who do some work that the community finds as useful. On this basis, we may build further. So he's not saying, he's not saying basic income is the end of social justice. He's saying it is an important piece, one to build on further. That was him writing, and I believe it was 1916, was it 1918? Um, I gotta remember these dates better. But, but that's, that's the very, the very influential uh, philosopher Bertrand Russell. Um, at about the same time, the feminist, the feminist, uh, uh, the feminist leader, uh, uh, the feminist writer Virginia Woolf gave a series of lectures and wrote, uh, and wrote a short essay called A Room of Her Own. And it was about how women are so unable to uh, move up economically and to pursue things like what she was doing, writing, because they had all these constraints on all these economic constraints on them. And uh, so what she proposed was a small income, enough that a woman could afford an, an apartment of her own, a room of her own with enough to eat and so forth. She was proposing a basic income, and not just for women, but for everyone, because this was going to be disproportionately good for all sorts of disadvantaged people, including women. Uh, and at, at about this time, the, the, uh, uh, a married couple named the Milners in Britain started something called the State Bonus League. And the State Bonus was a basic income. And all of these people, Bertrand Russell and, and the, the Milners and uh, uh, the Milners and, and Virginia Woolf, writing at about the same time in the teens and 20s, apparently had little or no knowledge of each other. Um, there was a circle of people talking about it in Britain in the 1930s who did finally uh, talk about it. And uh, G.D.H. Cole was one, uh, uh, Friedrich Hayek was one, several other people were started talking about basic income. And it was G.D.H. Cole who originally gave it the name basic income, although that didn't become the standard name for it for about 60 or 70 years after that. Um, and at that same time, there was another man named Major Douglas, who was sort of an, uh, he was like Henry George in the sense that he was kind of a, a non-economist economist who was put a lot of work into economics, but was outside of the community of economists and uh, he wasn't, wasn't classically trained or anything like that. He created something called social credit, his theory of social credit, which was about a lot of banking reforms and a lot of monetary reforms and included something called a national dividend, which was a basic income in most senses, except for one that it went up and down year to year to, contra uh, to contradict other things, uh, to counteract other things going on in the economy to help stabilize the economy. And some people, does that make it not a basic income or does that fit basic income? I think as long as everybody's getting the same amount, in that sense, it is a basic income. Another person writing about it at the same time and, and running on it was uh, Huey Long from Louisiana. Uh, Huey Long was a politician from Louisiana, was governor and senator from Louisiana at different times. And he created this program called Share the Wealth during the Depression in the 1930s. And he was going to run against Franklin Roosevelt because uh, he, he was saying that I can out-promise him. I can, uh, they, Roosevelt was doing all these things with the, uh, 
with the New Deal to try to fight the to fight the depression and help ordinary people. And he says, I can outpromise him with this idea of share the wealth, which essentially was a basic income. But he was actually assassinated uh, shortly before he was going to run for president. So that really never made it into presidential politics. And I don't think his assassination was related to his support for share the wealth. Uh, he was uh, he was also a corrupt politician and had lots of uh, nefarious contacts. It could have had something to do with that. Um, this, there was a social credit party that was created in Canada in response to what uh, to what. Uh, Major Douglas has, had been writing, and they actually took power at various times in two Canadian provinces um, in the west of Canada in the 1940s. But the, the social credit parties never actually moved to introduce social credit or the national dividend, and they were only at the provincial level, not at the national level, so they really were unable to put these reforms in. And then Interest in basic income began to die down around the time that World War II was finishing because the, the victorious powers and the new governments that they uh, ended up establishing in places like Japan and Germany and Italy after the war settled into the beverage model of welfare, which is the idea that most welfare systems around the world have been based on is that you need to, it was based on an idea of categorizing people, of saying that we want to get good jobs for people who are willing and able to work. And so we'll have a minimum wage and maybe some uh, things like health benefits or something like that, or guaranteed workers' compensation uh, for those who can work, unemployment insurance for those who could work but can't find it, and then we'll have other things for uh, such as aid to families with uh, uh, aid to families with dependent children, for uh, widows and orphans, and we'll have social security for old people, and we'll have who are people who are too old to work, and we'll have disability for people who are young but unable to work, and then we'll have uh, all education for those who are not yet educated to work. have all these different programs. If you fit in, we want to figure out what the causes of poverty are, and then fix the poverty for every different cause we see. Looking at it not the way I do or the way Thomas Paine does is that, well, those are causes of various issues, but they're really the cause of Poverty. If poverty is understood as a lack of access to resources, there's really only one cause that makes poverty the default starting point for every human being, and that is the fact that some people took all the resources and most of us didn't get a share. Um, so, uh, so this categorical approach is already based on an idea that the def there's nothing wrong with this default position where you start at zero. It's based on the assumption that it's your fault if you don't move up, not our fault for putting you in this horrible default position to begin with. Uh, but the reforms after World War II, or starting some before World War II, based on this conditional model, were sometimes very good. Uh, in the United States with Social Security, they almost eliminated poverty among the elderly. They didn't eliminate it, and then with cuts and so forth, it comes back and here and there. But they did reduce poverty among the elderly really tremendously. The elderly were, for a very long time in the United States, were the poorest group of people. And now they have the low, well, at least at one point, they had the lowest poverty rate of, of demographic groups in the United States, thanks to Social Security, a big success on this. Uh, now, uh, women, single women and their children are, are now the poorest group in the, in the United States. Well, not exactly a great success there. Um, but that's mostly because of cuts. At one time, uh, aid for women who were full-time caretakers was fairly generous in the 1940s and 50s and to some extent in the 60s and it's been cut ever since or allowed to deteriorate with inflation and more and more conditions have been put on the mothers telling them you are bad if you if you don't work if you just leisurely stay at home with your three kids all day instead of getting out and doing <laughs> doing real work you are a bad person unless your husband's rich then if you, you got to do this and if you don't you're, then you're a bad person. So if you're, yeah, it's a, I don't make the rules. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to change them. Uh, nobody lets me change them. So, um, but, but 
But a lot of these were very generous. And you find that um, some countries, uh, such as the Nordic countries uh, and many European countries, had different variations on this model. And some were very generous and actually made huge amount of progress based on this model. In uh, Finland and Sweden and Norway, I think at various times, they've gotten poverty down to like uh, two, three, four percent of the population based on this model. So they did make a lot of progress on this model. And of course, you never quite get it to zero with this model. And there's a reason you don't get it to zero with this traditional model. It's because the traditional model is the idea is that, well, if you can work, if we judge you as being one of those people who can and should work, uh, and you don't work, well, there's got to be some penalty for that, or all the jobs have to be fake. If you want everybody, to, if you want to hold people to a work requirement, and it's, it's a, not a fake work requirement, which is really doing nothing, going into the work and doing nothing all day, if you really want to make them do some real work where they can get fired, they can do it wrong, then there has to be some penalty. And the penalty for that is homelessness and poverty. So actually, homelessness and poverty is really an essential part of a conditional welfare state. It has to exist there as a threat for those who don't, who are supposed to work and don't meet the work requirement. So poverty does not go to zero on the conditional program. It can go near it, but it, it can't really go to zero because that's the underlying threat of our economy. Um, now, so anyway, so it goes down. So interest in basic income goes down in the 40s, uh, in the late 40s, in the 50s, in the early parts of the 60s as this model settles in of being the post-war model. But in the 1960s, People are rethinking things. Uh, American media is rediscovering poverty thanks to, uh, uh, thanks to some influential documentaries like The Harvest of Shame and the welfare rights movement where people on welfare are actually getting organized and marching in the streets. That's one thing that, and people, and that culminated with in, the, in 67 and 68 with with Martin Luther King getting behind basic income shortly before he was assassinated. This is not a trend, that's a coincidence. Um, uh, with two assassinations, that's the last assassination I'll be talking about. Um, now, um, and also there's this welfare rights movement is growing. There is also, there is also at the same time, there is an automation, there's concern with automation, which Funny, that's one of the things that's driving interest in basic income right now. But this has also happened in the 60s because this is the very early part of the computer revolution. And jobs were being automated away. They, um, they, didn't, uh, they didn't eliminate all the jobs, but a lot of people who had had good union jobs since the 40s or the 30s were beginning to be laid off and replaced and, and factories were starting to close and people could envision these computers are someday going to do a lot of things, replace a lot of labor. They were ahead of their time, but they were looking at this issue and uh, this was driving interest. They had people like uh, 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 Robert Theobald wrote, wrote and edited several books where he got major economists and major psychologists and other people to write about, including people uh, like, uh, like Eric Fromm, the, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most prominent psychologists at the time. And at the same time, there were a group of economists who had been working on this idea really since Hayek started talking about it in the 1940s. They were influenced by GDH Cole and other people from the first wave of basic income support. And economists had been writing about the idea in theory in the 40s and 50s when nobody else was paying attention about it. And a little article here and there would come out in the academic journal. Not a lot of them. Uh, Milton Friedman's book came out, I think, in 1960 or 61, Capitalism and Freedom. I think it was the name of the book, and he mentions basically, he actually talks very favorably about basic income there. Hayek is writing about it again, and uh, men, but it's not just economists from this side, but also economists from the other side. People like, uh, uh, like Tobin, people like Jane, John Kenneth Galbraith, um, who wrote The Affluent Society, and is very critical about the way society is organized. He comes out for basic income. Many economists get behind it. And then it becomes suddenly out of nowhere. It seemed like, even though it's really building on, on 50 years of ideas of basic income, uh, all of these people start coming together and realizing what the others are doing. And it, it becomes of interest to elected officials in the United States and in Canada and somewhat in the, in the United Kingdom as well. It doesn't really become a worldwide wave of support. It's mostly in these three countries. And 
It becomes to look like what economists at the time are proposing is, is the scientific solution to poverty. And we're having a war on poverty. Uh, Lyndon Johnson in 1965 has declared war on poverty. Um, and people are ready to rethink this traditional welfare categorical model. And so suddenly, from very few people talking about it by, in 1960, you get lots and lots of people talking about it in 1970, and you, got, and you get bills in Congress proposing something very much like a basic income, a negative income tax. I won't get into the differences here. You get bills in Congress for it. And you get a lot of support, um, but a lot of the support is sort of policy wonkish people. There is, uh, you've got a welfare rights movement for it, and you've got these economists and these policy wonks and these academics, and you've got interest at high levels and low levels, but you don't have a big groundswell of support of people in, in the middle. And welfare mothers are about the most marginalized political constituency in the United States, despite the large numbers uh, and really the importance of what they had to say, they found uh, people find them sadly easy to ignore. So um, what ended up happening, strangely, there were the Nixon administration got behind basic income, um, and they actually proposed a very watered-down version of a negative income tax in 1971, which was passed twice by the House and narrowly lost in the Senate both times. Um, and um, then in 1972, so Nixon was already on the record for it, uh, he, for a negative income tax, George McGovern started floating the idea of a full basic income. But in, de in uh, Democratic primary debates, he was asked some tough questions by Hubert Humphrey and that he couldn't answer. He hadn't been briefed well enough by his advisors. He couldn't answer them. And he didn't really make much of an issue out of it for, out of it for the rest of the campaign. And that 1972 election, when you have both candidates uh, of the major parties supporting basic income, uh, was kind of the high watermark of this uh, second wave of basic income support. And it died down without legislation without legislation that was, uh, well, without winning, of course. Uh, and so people tend to look back at the second wave as a failure. But it needs to be pointed out that a lot of things that happened during the second wave were very, it had a lot of important offshoots. One was food stamps um, and the earned income tax credit and uh, the child tax credit were all sort of outgrowths of this negative income tax movement. None is a true negative income tax, none is a true basic income, but there's something that moves in that direction. Um, so we have, so you have uh, some legislation that's at least a compromise with this movement for a guaranteed income. Then you had, you had five experiments sponsored by governments, five different experiments with uh, multi-million dollar experiments with hundreds, or, and in some cases, thousands of participants involved in them. Actually bigger than the experiments that we have now and with better, with, with better govern, government direction than we have now. Four of them were conducted in the United States, one in Canada. Now, these, and these experiments were really the first major social scientific experiments held for any policy anywhere. So those were very valuable. However, they had a very strange effect on the debate. The people who were conducting experiments also, well, if you have a negative income tax, you're go obviously people are not going to work as many hours as week. It's going to be that's going to be one effect. I mean, the average person will probably if they're if they're they have the ability to survive without working, probably the average person going to work uh, is going to work less. Um, the question is how much, how much less will they work and how will that affect the overall, uh, the overall uh, ability for this program to work? Is that going to sink the program? Is it, are there so many people going to stop working that the program becomes non-functional? Um, or is it going to be a small amount that we, can, that we can deal with? And they found it was a small amount that they could deal with, so they didn't think it was a big deal. And then they found a lot of other great effects, like uh, uh, Childhood health went up, educational attainment went up, illness went down, a psycho, um, 
um, psychological hospitalizations went down. A, a, a lot of really good things, the things that you want when you alleviate poverty, all were found to be happening in this. But when the results were released, the people who were, were producing the reports, the people who conducted the studies, were completely blindsided by the reaction. What was, was by this time, it was towards the mid to late 70s when interest in basic income was dying down. And the opponents understood what was uh, uh, where, where, where we're focusing on. The, the, the longer something is in the public eye, the more its op opponents are able to react to it. The opponents were far more ready to deal with the release of this information than the supporters were. So the opponents controlled the dialogue and they said, look, you introduce this program, hours per week of the average worker go down. They didn't worry, they didn't care how much, they didn't care how much it went down. Nobody, the fact that it only went down by, uh, in, in some case, like, uh, uh, well, how much it went down is, is hard to say with these, with these things. But uh, how much it went down was, is sometimes, some estimates as little as 3%, maybe 7%, um, maybe 10%, maybe an average hours per week per year. Really not uh, an incredibly large amount. But... They didn't. What, what the opponents said what, uh, made it sound like the test was, if we pay people not to work, will they work less? And if they do, then we can't have this program. As if the lower class is, all, is working the optimal amount right now. That, that any amount less that they could work is a horrible thing. The idea that lower class people could work less than they do now. Um, should outrage every uh, should outrage every uh, every uh, middle and upper class citizen, which is a funny way to look at it. When it has and nobody was interested in all these other effects on childhood health, even uh, the incidence of low birth weight babies went down, which is one of the biggest measures of prenatal health goes down. Infant mortality goes down. No one cares about this. They say, are the lower classes working less? Okay, we can't have this. Um, and even, uh, uh, I think it was Earl Long or Russell Long, one of uh, Huey Long's nephews, who's now on the opposite side of this. He went to the extreme of, of saying, well, if we, have, if we have basic income, who, well, I guess they call it guaranteed income back then. If we have a guaranteed income, who will iron my shirt? Very classist way to look at it. Maybe you should iron your own shirts than having, you know, than having uh, forcing some single mother to... Uh, to iron your shirt. So, um, so it was very much vilified. But one more good thing came out of this. And that was, out of the second wave, was the Alaska dividend. Alaska's, Alaska started getting oil money in 1969. They got a little bit of it in 1969 and squandered it. Uh, they had a, a They got a, a large amount of money in a very short time, and a couple of years later, it was all gone, and the state had very little to show for it. So when they got the Alaska pipeline in 1976, they were a little more ready, and they knew they were going to have a steady stream of income coming from oil that was going to last for a very long time. And luckily, it was a case of the right person in the right place at the right time. Uh, Governor Jay Hammond. Governor Jay Hammond was aware of the guaranteed income movement and was very interested in using something like this to make sure that every Alaskan benefited from the oil revenue. And between and he was he was governor of Alaska from 1976 to 1982. And it took all those years from him, political fighting here, there, everywhere, to finally get a situation where some small amount of Alaska's oil revenue went to a dividend. That dividend still exists today. It's been under attack for quite some time now. For the last five or ten years, it's been under a large attack. But it still exists. And it's a very popular program. It's much, much smaller than he wanted. If, if Alaska had, if Alaska had, had done had done what he wanted, it would probably the Alaska dividend would probably be in the neighborhood of ten thousand dollars today. I don't I don't have an exact figure. It has now been fixed at a thousand dollars per person. Which, if you're a single mother with three kids and you get a check for four thousand dollars, 
that's going to make a big difference for you if you're if you're if you're a, a person with a low income. It's not an insubstantial amount. Um, now, that interest died down in the United States with people like Reagan uh, vilifying just about everybody who's eligible for anything. Interest dies down here, but it takes off in Europe. People in Europe start writing about it. Um, there was uh, the first party to endorse the idea was a, a minor party uh, somewhere in Europe in 1977. There was a Dane who wrote a book about it in 1979. Um, and Niels Meyer, I think was his name. Um, and then in about 1982, uh, a Belgian named Philippe Van Parijs, who was totally in ignorant at the moment in 1982, ignorant of everything I've told you. He reinvented it in his kitchen when he was thinking about problems of poverty. And he then, of course, researched and learned that there was this huge wealth of history about it. And he found other people who were interested in it. Um, and he got a grant. In, uh, he got a grant to have a conference. And he invited Guy Standing, Hermione Parker, Annie Miller, um, and uh, uh, several other people who got together in 1986 and created the Basic Income Earth network. Um, a year earlier, the Basic Income Research Group had become the first national basic income network um, and in Britain. And this was, sorry, at this time it was called the Basic Income European Network in 1986. It was 18 years later, I believe, in 2004 when it changed its name from European to Earth and became a worldwide network. This network began having conferences every two years, and they created, a, they created a format where researchers could talk to each other about basic income. And that spurred more research in basic income. And a national network started here and there and there and these other, and this was very far out of politics. This was not, this was not, this was not a political movement. This is an academic research movement. There were a few activists involved in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. But these activists didn't have the, didn't have the numbers that you need. They didn't have a critical mass to really do activism. So they were actually mostly just writing about it and coming up with ideas like the academics. But interest far out of the mainstream was growing. Now, it did come into play. Um, I think Finland and Denmark and the Netherlands and Canada during this period and South Africa had times when, when political interest, mainstream political interest turned to basic income. These things sort of came and went at various times. But the movement was growing. It was hard for me to tell. I didn't find out about it. I was in 1980. I, I learned about the idea, and I I rarely met anybody who supported the idea. I was like, well, yeah, I support it, but it'll never happen, sort of thing. And it wasn't until uh, 1996 that I got together with some friends and found that that we're uh, we we're all finishing our PhDs that year, and found that we all supported basic income, and oh, we should start writing it, uh, writing about it. Then I I started co-authoring a, a paper with Michael Lewis, who I've been working with on and off ever since. We were into it, and I found out two years later about these conferences that BN was holding. I went to my first one in 1998, and this feeling of being at this conference with, uh, with uh, hundreds of other basic income supporters was just an amazing feeling, uh, and such a wonderful feeling, although there were bad things too. I was, before that, I always thought this was such a, such a mild, middle-of-the-road, sensible reform that it couldn't possibly have a, have a lunatic fringe. I learned that we have a lunatic fringe at this conference. So, uh, and uh, every movement will have a lunatic fringe. So I began to notice, but, uh, but it still it was so far out of the mainstream that it was hard to realize that the groundwork for a swell of support was happening. And it was, it was like, it was this support wasn't, wasn't growing, it wasn't getting more recognized in any one place, but it was spreading to more places. Um, then, um, in 2011, I volunteered along with Yannick Vanderbort and Jörg Drescher, to help create basic income, the basic income news for the basic income Earth Network news service. We had been, there had been newsletters uh, since the first basic income conference 
in 1986, and uh, I'd been writing the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network's newsletter since 2000, and these were email newsletters with sort of growing email lists, but there'd never been a news website. We created that in 2011, and about a year later, when Yannick and, and Jorg and I were watching the news, suddenly we noticed a huge increase in media attention to the idea of basic income. That's when we noticed, and we'd been paying really close attention. Now when I go, but what happened there? And I go, and, and, and I'm sure a lot of other people between 2012 and I noticed in 2020 have noticed this thing taking off. Well, a lot of different things happened, came together at the same time to create this rising wave of support. In the 60s, it was three things. It was these people writing about automation, the welfare rights movement, and these economists who'd been writing about it. In this period, it was many, many more things coming from many circles. One was simply activism building on activism. Um, in the mid 2000s, there was there there was uh, there were about six people in uh, I think Basel, Switzerland, who went to a shopping mall and started putting crowns on people's heads and telling them that everyone is a king and everyone should uh, everyone should have this small income and this was uh this connected with some argument it actually connected i think with uh uh well it connected with i think something that uh that uh, major douglas had said about basic income 70 years earlier but or someone else at that time uh, that was the first act i remember seeing a youtube video of this and thinking that's great that they're doing it, but is anything going to come of this? Then in 2008, the first basic income week was created by the three German-speaking countries, uh, German, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. They had an international basic income week. That's subsequently spread around the world. Um, in 2008 and 2009, you had this global financial meltdown, which caused the Great Recession, and it caused an interest in inequality and an interest in activism against it. Um, and a lot of these people didn't want a repeat of the old existing welfare state and were looking at, looking for a new model. And you had, and looking for a new model, they found 25 years of research on basic income that had been building up since the founding of the basic income uh, Earth Network and the Basic Income Research Group. There was a lot of available research to show that this is a well thought out policy. So a lot of people turn to this idea because of that. People with this big increase in unemployment that came along with the Great Recession, people started to think again about automation, replacing jobs, and a lot of attention from automation from the tech industry and from other people that are concerned about automation replacing jobs. And even if it doesn't replace all the jobs, if, even if all the jobs come back, if it takes away your job, your job that you've spent 20 years built, getting educated and then, and then working in the labor market, building up your skills in this field, and then your job is automated away and you start back at zero. That disrupts your life forever, even if there's even if you do find jobs. Automation is a concern, not just that all jobs are going to disappear, but it, it it turns the labor market and takes skilled people and throws them to the bottom and says, start over. I don't care if you're 55, start over. Um, so automation becomes a big concern. Um, in 20 10 and 2011, you get the Arab Spring, which was not about basic income, but it sparked activism around the world. It was majorly influenced over the Occupy Wall Street movement, the 99% movement. They got out there on the streets because of the Arab Spring, and they hit on basic income. Then, but what I think most sparked this growth was Actually, something else, something that happened, something that happened way back in 2006. I was at the Basic Income Earth Network Conference in South Africa, and a man named Bishop Kamita of the Namibian Lutheran Church got up and slammed his fist on the table and he said, Words, 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 we need action. Um, now, people did this all the time at conferences, and, and the, they'd always say that, and like, yeah, you guys are doing words, what you need is action, and I have the plan, and you should just do what I say. Um, I, I don't, I, I, so really, they were just offering more words and just telling everybody to do work. That's what most people who said things like this did, but Bishop Kamita was a bishop, 
uh, leader of a major church in Namibia, and he had been raising funds for the past year or so to conduct a basic income trial in a small village in Namibia. And he raised, he and his organization raised enough funds to have a basic income in a village of a thousand people for two years. That was followed by another privately funded trial, well, private public partnership in India. These are the first two lesser developed countries to have basic income trials, trying basic income in a totally new setting than the trials 30 years early in the United States in Canada. These trials were very successful, and this time the people that ran the trials knew how to manage the media better. The, and, uh, and so the reports on them were more controlled and more positive. Also, people started looking back at the results from the U.S. and Canadian trials 25 years earlier and comments reporting all this info. Look what it does for mental health. Look what it does for infant mortality. This stuff comes out and, and increases the basic income movement. Then, in 2012, both in the European Union and in Switzerland, so neighboring polities, you get petition drives for people who are, who, uh, for a ballot initiative to introduce basic income. The European one needed a million signatures. They got 450,000. But they organized in all 19 EU member states and got people to put their names on a piece of paper and write their signature down and say, ah, I want a, ba I want a referendum on basic income. They got people in Malta. And somebody went to the island of Malta and collected its signatures for basic income. It was fantastic. In Switzerland, the petition drive was successful. And that was success. I think that was, they turned in the petitions in, I think, 2012 or 2013. Huge media attention. Big marches. Uh, big marches for it. They had some money behind the campaign. Uh, they had huge banners. Um, and that started a two-year drive for, towards, the, towards the referendum, which I think was conducted in 2015, which, was, which, which focused media attention on this campaign over the next two years, brought more and more attention to it. And as that vote came near, that created a big groundswell in grassroots movement for basic income around the world. And the, the petition was unsuccessful. Uh, it was, so basic income wasn't introduced in Switzerland, but these referendums that they have in Switzerland tend not to succeed on their first time out. So this is actually to be expected as something you do to get people interested in the idea and to find out how you need to refine it to get people to vote to more than enough of them to vote yes in the future. So in res and then after this, you get various countries in the more developed world starting trials. Finland held a trial. Um, Spain and Italy and the Netherlands held trials on something that were quite similar to basic income. Scotland is talking about having a trial. Some private groups in the United States have had private, are, are right now conducting, conducting basic income trials. These have brought attention to basic income, along with reports from countries in the lesser developed world that have Remove, have gone from a more traditional welfare state to something they call conditional cash transfers, which although they're not a basic income because they have conditions, what they have is very simple and easy conditions to meet. Things like, you get this income if your children go to school. Now, I mean, it's not hard for most families to make sure their children go to school. Uh, these things, they found as you reduce these conditions, you have major positive effects on those in need. This sparks interest in basic income. And the automation movement becomes huge as you get more and more tech entrepreneurs, more prominent people like, like uh, uh, Elon Musk and, uh, and uh, two of the founders of Facebook are coming out in support of basic income. Uh, and then you get, in the last couple of years, the Andrew Yang campaign. The Andrew Yang campaign um, actually managed to get millions of people around the United States really excited about this idea of basic income. Andrew Yang runs for president with basic income as the flagship plank in his platform. 
and he gets into the baits. He gets lots of media attention. He gets Yang Gang set up in places, in, in, in towns as small as Mobile, Alabama, Mobile, Alabama and, and uh, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He gets interest across the country. He gets activism going. And a lot of these Yang Gangs are now that the Yang is out, are converting to basic income gangs. Uh, and, and now, in the wake of the Yang campaign, there are 40 people that I know of who are running for the Senate or the House of Representatives or some other fairly high office on a, a platform that includes basic income. I think some of them are going to get nominated and perhaps elected. Uh, to have a basic income caucus is an amazing thing is going on right now. And so now also really just one of these members of the basic income caucus, James Felton Keith, met up with one of the leaders of one of the grassroots basic income local groups that started in 2015 during the Swiss referendum, Basic Income NYC. He's from Harlem, she's from somewhere else in New York. And they got together, what can we do for basic income here? They said, we're going to have a march for basic income. We're going to have a march from, from Harlem to the South Bronx for basic income. And they scheduled that for October of 2019. But it's New York. New York still, despite all America has done to squander its influence in the world, still has outside influence in the world. 30 cities worldwide joined in this mark. New York is marching. Harlem is marching for basic income. Let's do one in Brisbane. Let's do one in Sydney. Let's do one in Montevideo, in Ghana, in uh, several cities in Europe, in Toronto, in San Francisco. There are marches in, 30, in all six inhabited continents in 30 different cities. Uh, and and out of this grows something called Income Movement, which gets together with International Basic Income Week that has been there since uh, 2008. And now uh, an annual Basic Income March will be at the end of the annual Basic Income Week. Th uh, this September will be the next one. This movement is growing activism. We have a caucus here. We have more and more parties in Europe and other countries supporting it. We have a bill in Namibia now for creating basic income. And we have growing support for it. That's where we are right now. More interest in basic income right now as we speak as there's never been before. Now, we don't know what's going to happen next. Next, maybe it'll continue to take off. Maybe it will decline for a while before it takes off. But there's been a really big base here. Uh, people who are just learning about basic income now are, at least some of them are going to stick around and become part of a, a long-term movement to try to make this thing work. The future of basic income is really bright, but it's a really tough fight because it goes against the traditional way of thinking that all everyone has to prove themselves before they get the means to survive. Everybody has to prove that they're worthy. Uh, of what they want. It has to go against that thinking. But the traditional welfare state isn't delivering. The idea of the traditional welfare state did make some sense. The idea, well, if we can just get everybody, if we can get the poor to prove that they deserve it, then certainly we will, we will take care of them. And then when we do, we will take care of them well because they, they prove they deserve it. And that will make the programs invulnerable to cuts. Because look, they're going to people who really prove they deserve it. But it's never done that. We've never eliminated poverty. The poverty in the United States has gotten, I think, never below 10%. Even though we have all these harsh tests to make sure, prove it, prove it, prove it. More and more restrictions, we still tend to view everybody who's eligible for just about everything as some kind of criminal. So we've been cutting the programs, making them harder and harder to get on. And the same is true in Europe, and even some of the most generous welfare states in Europe have not been invulnerable to cuts, and they've been attacked. And, and the vulnerability that the, the middle and lower classes feel, and the increasing inequality, as long as we have these problems, the inherent problems with the conditional welfare state remain obvious, and that creates an avenue for basic income. So I'm very optimistic about basic income's future, but I'm happy to talk about 
uh, anything about its future or any questions about this history that you'd like. Thanks a lot. All right, uh, so we are gonna get into questions now. I have this handy microphone that I'm gonna pass around. Um, anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah. I, I was very interested in the, the origin uh, from the land enclosures mm -hmm. and the colonial activity mm -hmm. and all that. I hadn't really yeah. thought about that. Mm -hmm. and, and that really argues for what some people uh, conflate with a you know, desire for basic income, which is a desire for equality, that there's too much, you know, in the hands of the 1% mm -hmm. and all of that. Something which, when we talk about basic income, we don't, we kind of separate those two things. Mm -hmm. um, and so that idea of the origin brings it back. It even brings it back to an idea of, of a generalized reparations uh, kind of thing that everybody has been taken from. Um, and so there's that part that I found, I just wanted to mm -hmm. comment that yeah. that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about was negative income tax. Um, and I don't really understand what that does and why it's even in the same conversation with uh, basic income. Mm -hmm. how, how does it get money to people? It just mm -hmm. means not taking more money from people, right? By income tax? No, I, I, I can explain the difference. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the... Yeah. Hold on. Okay, so, um, what's on the combat of, of, of compensations? I... I uh, I, 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 I went and when I was when, when I was invited to to speak at uh, at the basic income march in New York last fall, I, I ended my uh, I, I ended my speech saying that we've owed each other a basic income since we abducted the slaves, since we enclosed the commons, and since we killed the buffalo, uh, and. It is it is very very long overdue. We have we have created this situation that um, makes every person in the ninety nine percent a a ready uh, a ready worker for every everybody in the more privileged. We don't all work for each other. We all work we all work for those who own property. And the more work for more, more property they own, the more we owe them our labor, and the more and we're all set up to be ready to do that. Um, now. Now the question of negative income tax. Okay, basic income and and negative income tax are both forms of what the U, the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network have been calling a big or a basic income guarantee, which internationally is more commonly called uh, a guaranteed minimum minimum income, a guaranteed annual. Income. The idea of that is that there ought to be a floor below which nobody's income can fall. The way I put it is uh, the idea of a basic income guarantee is just that income doesn't have to start at zero. We don't need to threaten everybody with poverty and homelessness if they don't do any work. We can just make it. It's, it's a, some basic level. It's enough to live on. Keep yourself alive and then we'll give you incentives. Uh, if you do some work that the community finds useful, you get more. We want to have a floor under everybody's income. It doesn't have to start at zero. Now there's two ways to do that. One is to have that level of income, have a basic income that is universal, that goes to everybody, rich or poor, that gets you to that level. Uh, and uh, that is basic income. Another way to do it is to means test it and say, well, everybody who doesn't have a private income that is above this level, we're going to, we're going to give you something to get you to that floor. So we don't give it to everybody, we give it to everybody whose income whose income falls short. And both of them can be structured so that you always have an incentive to earn more. Earning another dollar doesn't, doesn't hurt you. Doesn't, it actually makes you somewhat better off or fully, fully or partially better off if you, uh, if you do it. So both of them are structured so you're not, uh, you're not in some poverty trap. You're afraid to earn more money. But both of them create this floor in a different way. People who prefer basic income you over negative income tax usually argue that it's that it's much. If you want to make sure everybody gets it when they need it, you go with a basic income model. The means tested model will always be always have some cracks in it, whereas so the basic you're income no longer. Tested and negative income tax. Or? Negative, yeah, negative income tax. If your income is low, then we give you the money. Okay. Whereas basic income, we give you the money regardless of whether your income is low or not. 
Uh, okay, anyone else have any questions? We can pass the mic around. If not, we can get to a comment from the live stream. Uh, yeah, so uh, on the live stream, uh, Jay Gannon says, uh, we need a Republican to support basic income. And then there's another comment that um, there are some uh, local Republican candidates at least considering running for Congress. Um, so I'm wondering, Carl, if you could speak to the partisanship of basic income today. Is it only, is it mainly a Democrat thing or to what extent is it, does it cross political lines? Uh, the, that's an interesting thing about basic income. First of all, as far as, from what I understand, the UBI caucus has its first Republican member. Someone running for the Senate in Montana as a Republican, which is the only way to win the Senate in Montana, uh, is has joined the UBI caucus. So it has its first Republican member, according to a headline that I saw on Facebook. I, I, I read a lot of headlines that my friends post on social media, and only rarely do I actually click and read the whole article. So I read a headline. So that's what I, so, um, so that's what I know about Republicans actually in the, uh, in the, in the caucus. Now, back in, back in, the 60s and 70s, during the second wave of basic income support, it was very different. This was something that appealed across the board, and it appealed across the board, uh, but it also had uh, created enemies across the board. Um, Republicans saw it as a way to simplify and streamline this massive welfare state that wasn't very cost effective. They went, well, well, if we're going to have it, we might as well spend less, get more, and this could be a way to do it. So we'll go to a negative income tax model. Um, the, whereas Democrats saw it, Democrats saw it as um, something to really fill in all the cracks of the welfare state and make it more effective. And so there was something on both sides, but there was something to anger both sides. Uh, a lot of conservative Republicans were like, every poor person shall work. Of course, rich people, they don't have to. They can work on their rentier money. But poor people have to work. It's a sin for all poor people not to work. You're, 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 uh, you're paying for vice and sin. And, um, so there was that idea. But also, a lot of, pe a lot of people on the, to the left of center saw it as a threat to this welfare state. That, they, that was built up. Because one of the basic income proposals, uh, and one that was fairly popular, especially on the right side, was, well, if we're going to have basic income, let's get rid of everything else. Get rid of all those welfare policies. Replace it with a basic income, because everybody needs cash. Cash buys just about everything. Replace it with a basic income. And, there's, and people are like, well, if you do that, um, then you've only got one policy. And then... Then all the Republicans have caught all, all the other policies. Then if they cancel this policy or cut it in half or let it erode with inflation, then all of the welfare state will be gone. So they thought it was a potential threat to the welfare state rather than filling in the cracks. So it's something for everyone and something, uh, something uh, to, to anger everyone. And that could be some of the reason that it, it didn't get traction. But also, when you have a coalition like this, it, it's actually hard to build a cross-party coalition because you go to welfare, you go to the welfare rights movement and they say, Nixon likes this policy. Wait, wait. Now, if Nixon likes this policy, it must be horrible. I can't get on, you know. And the same thing on the other side. So it's hard to build that coalition. Now, so today, this is mostly gone. There's the, the support from most of the places around the world is coming from the left of center, especially in the United States. Not so true in Finland. Finland, actually, there's some support on, on both sides and maybe some other places where it isn't. The United States is mostly coming from the left of center. The one exception to that is libertarians. Uh, there are a considerable number of libertarians, and pr very prominent libertarians in the United States, who are for basic income, uh, based on this idea of simplifying the, the welfare state and more, making it more cost effective. The conservative, I, and that's something that you would think would appeal to conservatives, but the conservatives, there's a very good reason that very few conservatives make that argument anymore. It's because they've been cutting the welfare state since Reagan took office in 1981 and replacing it with nothing. So why do they want to make it more cost effective when they can just keep cutting it and replacing it with nothing, which is what they really want? So you get little of that from conservatives, but you do get that at least from the libertarian wing of the conservative side. So the, the right of center view, uh, right of center argument for basic income is very small these days in the United States.
Uh, okay. Anyone have any more questions? Yeah. I I want to be Um, uh, it's, uh, thanks for your, your um, very detailed uh, description uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the history. Really appreciate mm -hmm. the fact that you put all that together. Uh, um, I, I was wondering if you saw any kind of common threads, uh, in particular as to the causes of the, the different movements that grows or, 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 uh, and the different pushback that, that they got. So, so you mentioned a lot of details about individual cases and individual time periods. I'm wondering if there's any kind of commonalities that, that, that you can speak to. Yeah, some things, some things, some things keep coming back. Um, when I got to my first basic income conference, in 1998, and I was in this room of like 300, this auditorium, like 300 people. I was like, wow, I really like these people. Uh, because um, I didn't know if, they, I'd already hit on that the, the major reason that I support basic income is I think it's wrong to, for one human being or any group of human beings to deny any other group of human beings access to the resources they need to survive. Even if they say, well, if you do this, that, and the other thing, then we'll give you access to the resource you need to survive. Even in those cases, I think it's wrong. I think the starting point ought to be not the threat of starvation. And, uh, and that this is something people have, that they have direct access to resources. That's been taken away, so we're owed it because it creates our... Uh, it's cruel to use it, and it's, you can make people unfree by putting them in this situation and make, really make people free. You have to, this is why I support it. And uh, not everybody who supports basic income supports it for that reason. But I get into this room and I realize nobody in this room is so concerned about this idea that everyone must work that they will use that as a reason to oppose basic income. So on the side of basic income, you've always had people that are comfortable, at least comfortable with the idea that someone who is able to work will refuse to work. You're at least comfortable with that idea, if not siding with me, that that should be their right, because work is the subordination of the less privileged to those who control property. So everyone should be able to. Now, so not everybody's on board with me that they should have the right to work, but they're at least comfortable with the idea that it's okay if they don't. Whereas the central opposition tends to come from this idea that everyone must work. But that's not that's not the only thing. Some is, well, this is going to be this is going to be a threat to other programs. There's a lot, or it's gonna to be too they will say it's too costly. These kind of ideas come up. So a lot of commonalities come up, but that underlying tension between are you comfortable with this idea that not everybody has to work uh, is a is a big underlying thing. Now do you have it looks like you have a follow-up. That is, inform that is informative, mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess um, what I was hoping we might be able to delve a little bit deeper into mm -hmm. is if there's any kind of uh, predictors of when um, the movement will uh, collapse uh, uh, and rise again. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Now, it has risen. It, it's, it, it has risen at times when people are ready for one reason or another to rethink what we're doing about inequality and poverty. Um, and uh, in 1920s, in 1920s, you had a booming economy in, in a lot of places, but it not helping those least advantaged. And you had very small welfare states. People are looking at what, what to do. In the 1930s, you've got a disaster, an eco a worldwide economic disaster happened, people rethinking that. But what threatened that is in was in 1945, when people settled around another model. And they are, look, they're using this conditional model and, they're, and they're, they've got, uh, they're, really, they're really settling on this model and there's a lot they can do within this model. Well, in the 1960s, it comes back when there's economic awareness of poverty, there really wasn't that much more poverty in the, in the 1960s than there was in the 40s and 50s, but people were becoming aware of it. There was more insecurity. People were feeling the insecurities uh, with Vietnam, the civil rights movement, and so forth going on in the United States. You get awareness of this, and you get this war on poverty where people are rethinking, is what we're doing working? Now, 
what brings it down in the 1970s is people turn one thing people turning to other issues people forgetting about look we haven't solved this issue of poverty uh, that but also people concerned about about various other issues and this idea of this very successful idea of Reagan in the United States and Thatcher and Britain and other politicians like them around the world that they can vilify just about everyone who is eligible for anything and make that an excuse to cut stuff. That brings it down then. Now, it's brought back because of so much uncertainty. The Great Recession was probably the biggest underlying factor in bringing it back. And that returned people's concern with, with inequality, poverty. Automation is happening and people are, are afraid that they're not going to succeed the way their parents did. This thought that the generation that's now entering the workforce or the or that entered the workforce within the last last 10 or 20 years will not rise to the level that their parents did, they're going to see worth. This makes us rethink what we've been doing for the last few years. That's what's helped it rise. What can really kill it, what can really kill it is if more people believe what people like Trump and Boris Johnson are telling them. That the problem is not privileged people in your country aren't sharing the resources. The problem is caused by the most vulnerable people in the country. Look, it's those immigrants. It's those people in those, uh, in those uh, confined uh, places at the border uh, where we jail people for seeking asylum or wanting uh, 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 poor huddled masses yearning to breathe free should, should be put into jails uh, for years on end, waiting for their asylum cases or whatever else to be heard. They're, it's their fault, or it's the foreigner's fault. The problem is not, uh, the problem is not I inherent inequalities in our labor market, and the problem is not uh, automation that's taking your job, but is those it is uh, companies relocating overseas or unfair competition from China. If you can get people to blame immigrants and foreigners and low uh, and uh, domestic people that we judge to be inferior, if you get people to blame those people for your problems, uh, then you can turn people's attention for you. So I think economic nationalism and elitism is the biggest threat to the basic income movement now. Just following on that, it seems mm -hmm. like another thing that could reduce interest is something more similar to what happened in the 1940s, where mm -hmm. other solutions that might improve things, but but basic income components might think do it less well, like strengthening unions again, or a jobs guarantee would be the most extreme example of this alternative approach, you know, start to make people feel that the problems are being resolved with a new model, kind of like the welfare mm -hmm. model in the 1940s. I wonder if you, if you think you, how you see that well, likelihood versus maybe basic income gaining more strength as, as a solution. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it is interesting. Uh, I don't know how familiar uh, people are with the federal, the idea of a federal job guarantee. This idea has been floating around at least since the 1930s, um, and its growth has lagged behind the growth of the basic income movement over the last 10 years, but it's also having a wave of support right now, um, brought on partly because of the Bernie Sanders campaign, who has uh, hired some economists uh, who, who are, have been supporters of the federal job guarantee uh, to be his major economic advisors. The idea of a federal job guarantee is that if you have people who are willing, able, and looking for work, but don't have jobs, then just the government will hire. So uh, if, if, if you, so every little town would have its FJG office, federal job guarantee, and, and uh, they would be paying, well, hopefully $15 an hour. I don't know what they, I don't know what the plan is, but you know, hopefully it's a good wage. And if you want to work, you go in there and you work and you get a day's pay. You don't want to come back tomorrow, you don't come back tomorrow. You come back two days later, you get another, you know, work. So you can work there every day. You can work there, you can work there full time if you want, or you can work there one day out of your entire life. Uh, and every little town would have one. Everybody who wants a job gets a job. It's an interesting idea. Now, it doesn't do everything basic income does, but it also does something basic income doesn't. That is, if you want to work, we'll get you a job. Basic income doesn't do that. Can't ensure that everybody who wants a job gets one. But 
basic income can eliminate poverty. Federal job guarantee can't do that because not everybody can work. Um, they do different things, but they are both uh, they are both a um, a real rethinking of the traditional welfare model. Federal job guarantee, in a sense, works with it because the way I've defined the traditional model is it's conditional. Federal guarantee, job guarantee is, is another conditional program. You've got to do this to get that. But it is, in a sense, more universal. They've tried to create full employment by demand stimulus and subsidizing employers here and there and something, but now with a comprehensive universal program for everybody who wants to work. You want to work, you get a job. So it is, in a once, it, it is an important step towards universality. Now, if, so if Bernie, and it is, and it, it, so it's a major expansion of the conditional program. It still clings to that conditional idea, but, but moves in a big expansion towards it. If you wanted to have a federal job guarantee, and then alongside of it, a, a lot of generous conditional programs, you could probably get the United States down to where uh, some of the Nordic countries were, where you had like one or two percent uh, on a, uh, a poverty rate in the country. Maybe you'd, you'd do that. So now it is possible. So, so, so say Bernie Sanders was, was going to come back in the uh, he, say he comes back in the presidential race, and let's say that a whole bunch of people who get along with Sanders get elected to Congress, and he uh, starts, he has the power to start reforming, getting us into the federal job guarantee model, and, and we get a federal job guarantee. Yeah, that could be, uh, that could be like what happened in the 1940s. Then we're going to be talking about how to get this federal job guarantee model to work for the next 20, 30, 40 years. That could be a way to plug it. And also, if that happened in the U.S., thanks to America's overblown worldwide influence, probably lots of other countries around the world were doing it. So it could, that could spark a worldwide movement for federal job guarantee for decades, which could, which could reduce guaranteed income. That I think is sadly such a nicer scenario, but much sadly a less likely one than the one where, where they just convince the average person to blame foreigners for everything. Which you see is kind of more analogous to the Reagan example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, before we get to Alex's question, you can hand on the mic. Uh, before we get to Alex's question, uh, we have another comment from the live stream, um, which is uh, Jay Gannon says he can't imagine uh, basic income without strong uh, border policy. So what are your thoughts on uh, basic income and its compatibility with open immigration, open borders, that kind of thing? Well, basic income is usually defined as a citizen's income. Um, and nations have the ability to decide who, how long you have to be there before you're eligible for it. Um, so I, I, there's really no worry whatsoever that we introduce a basic income here tomorrow and then uh, the two billion people working on a dollar a day around the world are going to show up in America the day after and demand their basic income guarantee, they wouldn't be eligible. We would have some rule, well, much less, even if they could get here, we'd have to have some rules for eligibility. Um, so that idea uh, that, that we're worried about foreigners coming here and taking our basic income is really, it's, not, it's a non-worry. Uh, there's nothing to worry about because we can say, okay, you're not a citizen, you don't get it, or you're not a resident for X number of years, you don't get it. That's not what I worry about. What I worry about is it becoming a, a, a system of exploitation. Or say, okay, no citizens are no citizens are in poverty because we have basic income for all citizens, but we have we have uh, all these Ghanaians and Guianans and uh, Equatorial Guineans uh, um, and New Guineans and people from all the G country, the Georgians and <laughs> people from all the G countries come here and they become this lower class group of people working for an amount that's less for the basic income and it becomes a method of exploitation. And if you think this could never happen, well, maybe you should go to Qatar or Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates, where that's basically what's happening. They don't have a basic income, but they have very generous programs that what, what they have basically is a fake jobs program for citizens, um, where you don't really have to work, you don't really get fired, and, and if you want, uh, um, and so they have virtually eliminated poverty among their citizens, but they've imported the poorest workers in the world to work for wages that are much worse than everybody in the United States, except for some, uh, except for, uh, uh, except for, um, 
the gray market workers we have who are undocumented aliens who are working as um, things like migrant laborers and other things and day laborers in the United States. We have some of these people working similar conditions here under, in those things. Those are officially illegal, but there it's been legalized. But that could happen here if we have a basic income with too restrictive a policy for how long a foreigner can, uh, has to live before they're eligible. We've got to let foreigners earn their eligibility when they come here as immigrants. And it's wrong to try to keep everybody out. This country isn't, this country isn't full. We could be taking on a million or two immigrants a year, no problem, maybe more, maybe a lot more. Okay, uh, Alex, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed the, the talk and particularly the connecting it to the, mm -hmm. the first inclusion movement mm -hmm. and thinking about the acts, you know, denying acts to the commons and and how that sort of essentially set up the system such that, you know, you, you, you had to basically work for a living because you didn't have access to resources. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, how much you've thought about connecting that to kind of like, you know, secondary and tertiary enclosure movements that are happening now. Like, for example, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of things like intellectual property, you know, with the rise of the internet and with things like, um, you know, copyright law, software patent law, you've got a whole sort of, it's, it's almost like there's this whole, you know, um, uh, new, part of human um, uh, human re human resources that have been now colonized by again like you know maybe back back in the late late 90s it was kind of sort of the wild west and you got a few people who got there first like the, the Googles and stuff and now they've essentially kind of created another enclosure so I, I, I don't know where I'm going, exactly going with this but <laughs> essentially how do you see that fitting into this kind of model of basic income where we have like because you know you're sort of essentially having a another another form of of, of uh, enclosure resources that is being dominated by a few large companies you know digital i, I call them the digital overlords essentially mm -hmm. how do how do we sort of tackle that as part of the basic income model yeah um yeah uh this is very important the, the uh the i the idea that the common there's 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 actually new co new commons being developed all the time or new ways of enclosing the commons are developing uh, uh de of commons that we haven't thought of um, are being enclosed enclosed all the time that um we that we call this system capitalism or the market economy, but uh, uh, maybe it should be called rentierism because that's really where the money is in the economy we have today. The big money is not in doing stuff, which when you think about uh, uh, capital, you think you build your capital with your efforts and then your capital works for you. That's the idealized model. But the, and sometimes it does work like that, but very often it is about gaining ownership of assets and then living off the income that those assets make and actually never working for it. Harvard is one of the best examples of this there is. Harvard, last I checked, they had an endowment of, uh, of $40 billion. Um, it's probably went up to 60 and then back down to 45 or something since I last checked with the fluctuations of the market. I don't know where it is now, but they... Traditionally, uh, they have billions of billions of dollars in this endowment. And it's an institution. It doesn't work. It just puts the money, it gives the money to investors. And, they, and it, since they have this huge chunk, they get the world's greatest financial managers. And they get, since they have such large amounts of money, they get preferential buying of everything. They make an average return of something like 10 or 12%, way beating the market way beating the market. Their managers make the people doing the work of figuring out where the portfolio is invested, not the people doing the actual work of making the stuff or whatever these companies are invested in. But the people who are doing the work of figuring out what to invest in make like a half, of the, a half a percentage point of that. The rest just goes for the, Harvard happens to own the endowment. And the endowment's just been growing with no effort on the part of Harvard uh, since the 1700s. With, um, when they started investing it. Um, the big money in this economy is ownership. N the, and, uh, however, and it is not just you work hard, you invest, then you get ownership. It is very often you go to the government 
and you may have them make you an owner of something. You pay the right donations, and the government makes you an owner. Back in I th- about about twenty years ago, the government was doing this a little technical thing. Okay, we're we're going to uh, we're going to get rid of analog TV broadcasting, and we're going to have digital TV broadcasting. And they they uh, they reorganized how they're they're assigning people to rights to this common resource, the broadcast spectrum. It's a commons. It's been, a, it's, it's been available for everyone. What they, they do is they give it away to broadcasters, is that the digital TV people get this band, and radio gets this, citizens band radio gets that, cell phones get that, um, uh, other kinds of communication get this other thing. They give the whole thing away. <coughs> and then those companies sell it back to us. And those companies get not only the value added they put by making the cell phones, but they get the rental value on the chunk of the internet that they own, uh, the internet, the chunk of the broadcast spectrum that they own, the government just gave them that for free. That's where the money is in capitalism. That's how you get rich. Um, And there's so many things about that, uh, things that are uh, common resources we don't need. Probably most people in this room have pennies in their pocket right now. I don't. I throw them in the trash where they belong. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you know, I, I, um, you can't be able to buy something for a penny in like 60 years, but we're still making them. Do you know why? Because the company that makes pennies spends donations to members of Congress to say, keep buying what I'm selling. You pay somebody who has power over the people's buying choices to buy what you're selling. So we still keep buying the pennies. That's how Washington works. When either party does anything for its actual voters is in their spare time when they get done buying the things that the donor class has wanted to sell them. We think the problem that creates inequality in this country is taxes are too low on the wealthy. Well, that's a problem, but that's not the big problem. The big problem is the government is giving them stuff for free. The broadcast spectrum, the internet, the government and peep and scientists created that together. The people made it valuable by getting online and doing this that and the other thing, and the companies captured the value because the government gave it to them. So this is how the commons gets privatized. And you're right, it is ongoing. New commons are being created and new commons are being, and those new commons are being seized by by people all the time. Yeah, no, I sort of wonder, um, I, th- I feel like whether you disagree with Andrew Yang's policy to to get that, I think he kept, got that at that intuition that there's a that that's where the money is by the, his mechanism for funding it through the VATs on Google and 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 Facebook and that. I feel I feel like I'm not sh- I, I, what I what I'm interested in is, is 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 do you think that's a really good argument for now that people kind of know what it means to to get people thinking about like where the wealth is in terms of how to how to fund a basic income. Now, I do not think the B, this is something I disagree with him about. I do not think the, the VAT is the best way to get to corporate profits. What I've heard is that um, I think roughly when you have a VAT, um, I remember reading somewhere that uh, I think 55% of it comes from, tends to come from corporate profits and the other 45% from from the, the people who are buying the stuff. So they, they pass roughly 45% on the con- consumer, or um, maybe it's flipped around where the, the 45% on the companies and 55% on the consumers. I don't remember, something, like, something close to half. So you are getting something from the firms, but you're also getting quite a bit from the consumers. Um, so it's not the greatest way to get from those. Now, Andrew Yang has given up on the wealth tax. He's, he's been tried in places and hasn't worked. I'm not convinced that that means no version of the wealth tax is going to work. Uh, but I haven't looked into it, so that I don't know. But what I have looked into, and what I'm convinced will work, is taxes on resources and rents. If we stop giving away the broadcast spectrum for free, and started charging the full rental value of the of of it, then then we would make huge amounts of money. If we charge, if we, instead of the government lending money to banks for almost nothing and let them, let them lend it back to us five times at, 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 at three times the interest rate and they rent, lend, lend, lend us the same dollar five times, uh, then, uh, 
uh, then if we t and then they take all the private profits and and bankers not not government officials for profit bankers control the federal reserve board and run it for their own interests not for the people's interests we got to take these things back there's an enormous amount of things like this that we can do that raises the revenue that we need stop these government giveaways and start charging for them that i think is the best model uh, that's and that's much more fundamental than yang's vat Okay, uh, so we have another comment from the live stream. Uh, to what extent is basic income related to uh, distributism? So we often talk about in here how basic income gives people access to the means of consumption, money, mm -hmm. so you can buy stuff. Um, what, what about the distribution of the means of production? Um, how does that factor in? Well, I am skeptical of the idea of, of worker control of the means of production because the devil's in the details. Um, that was a good game that the communists talked about. The worker needs to control the means of production before they got in power. They, used to say that they would make some of the arguments I'm making here that, look, the, the, the worker has nothing to sell but their labor. Uh, we have wage slavery. We need to have worker control of the means of production. But it wasn't worker control of the means of production. It was centralized, a new privilege group. It was Politburo control of the means of production, which didn't make the workers any better off. So um, Katja Kipping, the head of Die Linke, which is German for the left, Die Linke party in Germany, said the old left wanted to control the means of production. The new left wants to control their lives. And that's what basic income does, and that's why she's for basic income. Um, that's where I think, is if you give the worker the power over their own life, where they're not beholden to the need to control, to go to the means of production, then you begin to put them on a more equal footing. Maybe, some, maybe more is necessary, as Bertrand Russell said over 100 years ago, on this basis we build further, it's not the end. So that is what I think is most essential. Now, there is another way you could do it. If you had decentralized worker control of the means of production, rather than centralized so-called worker control of the means of production, and even if you had, if it's centralized, even if it's democratic, I, I think that is going to favor some, it's going to favor a privileged majority against an underprivileged minority. Even if it's democratic, I'm, I'm skeptical of that. If you had some decentralized way, so that we all had our own access to the means of production, then maybe, but I'd want to see the plan. I haven't seen a plan like that that convinces me how you could have decentralized control of the means of production. Uh, and so I'd, I'd have to see a plan, but I think the, the first step is to take this threat this underlying threat of poverty and homelessness away from the 99%. Okay, uh, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions, yeah. Um, so do you have any thoughts on like uh, potential, like one of the criticisms I hear a lot is that, oh, if you give everyone money, then that'll just cause, you know, inflation. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on that and, you know, potentially any uh, sort of taxes that you'd use to, you know, reduce that if it does occur? Oh yeah, that, that I've, I, I never, I, I've never really written anything on inflation and basic income because the answer I think is so easy. Basic income is not special spending. All government spending creates inflationary pressure. You, government spends more, they're creating more demand for goods, um, that is going to push up prices. That's inflationary pressure. But every time the government taxes or sells bonds, you know, taking in debt, that, that creates deflationary pressure. And the job of the government is to balance the inflationary pressure it does with its spending and the deflationary pressure it does with its taxes and interest rate policies and borrowing and stuff, oh, the, these, to balance these two pressures. Um, and uh, whenever you buy an aircraft carrier, that's, that is, um, that is inflationary pressure. That needs to be counteracted with these other policies to have some deflationary pressure and balance them out. Now, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. You do not have to have an exactly balanced budget. As a matter of fact, you can have some money creation every year and some ex uh, uh, spending can exceed taxes without even borrowing to make it up. Exactly how much that can be per, is going to vary year to year, but you tax, 
get some more out there. Uh, if you spend, get some more out there. Inflationary pressure, get some back in with deflationary pressure. No problem. You finance it. It's, a, it's not an issue. Anyone else? Do you want to ask them? Uh, I don't really have a question prepared. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see on the uh, on the live stream. Eh, it's not really that much on the live. Oh, so yeah. Why don't we bring up? Uh, so uh, next week's topic. We're going to be on Wednesday again. Uh, we're going to be talking about. Uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and the impact on the economy, all of that. We've talked a little bit about, you know, things kind of setting off more, um, people feeling more of a need for something like a basic income. And there's someone on the live stream uh, who brought this up too. So um, I guess maybe speak to what, how do you think uh, coronavirus might affect uh, people's uh, desire for basic income? Well, people have pointed out... <laughs> So many, I, 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 it's, so, it's funny, I don't remember people pointing this out during SARS, but people have pointed out these connections I've noticed for coronavirus, that um, we have poor people, uh, lots of, lo most of the people uh, that work at our food service industry are on the edge of poverty or in poverty. Um, and they can't afford to take a day off and they don't have health insurance. So the sickest people in the country are serving our food and they can't afford not to work when they can't afford not to work when they get sick so they go and they they, they take a bunch of dayquil they try to mask their symptoms and they go in and serve our food and arguments like this go back to uh uh down and out in paris and london by george orwell one of my favorite writers he talks about this it's like you go to a fancy restaurant and you're eating a lot of spit and the crap and he gives all the story uh, um, and uh, and i actually have there's actually there's actually it's not just about being uh, people being too poor to take a day off work but what I experienced, and this is also the, the power that your boss has over I remember my first year out of college, I had an economics degree from the University of Michigan. So naturally, I started as a, a pizza delivery driver um, <laughs> at Benny's Pizza in Crestwood, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And uh, I took one weekend off to go back to Ann Arbor and visit uh, visit my old haunts, you know, and then I get back and I'm, I get back and I'm sick and it's like Tuesday, you know, and I, 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 I can barely talk. And I'm like, uh, I got like, uh, I think, I think I might, you know, okay, I'm supposed to start working in today, but I think I, I might be too sick to come in. And they're like, you just took five days off. You can't have another day off. You got to come in here. Okay. So I go in and I'm like, that's your problem. I told you I might be, you know, I'm delivering pizzas to all your customers. If you want me to come in sick, <laughs> That's your choice. It's on you, buddy. So it's not just being too poor. It's also that it's all that power that, that people have over in this, uh, this uncaring. And how we work out this system where, the, where, where people serving food don't have an incentive to avoid making their customers sick. Because you get sick, you're not going to know it was the pizza delivery driver. It could have been a million other things. All right, so... Um takeaway from that is maybe don't order too many pizzas <laughs> in the coming weeks and months. Uh, yeah. Um, so unless anyone has any final questions, I'll, 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 you know, final thoughts, any, any, any important things you want people to take away from this in the history of basic income? Yeah. Unless Patrick, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so uh, my other question would be, um, what do you think we should use to like determine the level of a basic income? So I know you know Yang at the thousand dollars a month, which is roughly the poverty line. Um, other proposals I've seen would you know increase with inflation and maybe productivity. Um, and then I think Martin Luther King wanted his to be closer to the median income. So I was wondering your thoughts on that. Um, I think that. Uh, I think, well, like, $1,000 a month is a nice starting point. Um, I have difficulty with Yang's proposal because it, it, it does not include children. Single mothers with children are the poorest demographic group in the United States. And if you grow up in poverty... That will affect, there's no amount of money we can give you when you turn 18 that will make up for that. That will 
will create risks for you for the rest of your life. The person that gets out of that and, and becomes a great success, it happens, but it's so rare. And often they are scarred in important ways, even if they're, even if they're wealthy. There's nothing that makes up for that. Um, and it's not a cost just to the individual, but that creates cost to society to short-sight it, to have any human being growing up in poverty in your country. The most important people are not helped enough. Now, $12,000 for a single mother with two or three kids is better than nothing. But in some states with the more generous welfare systems, it's actually less than they're getting now. Yang is giving them the opportunity to, to, to choose. But it seems to me that we should make the, 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 the most vulnerable group in our society, we should you know, put them first, so include the kids and actually make it at the poverty line, not almost at the poverty line. So include the kids, get them there, I think would be, a, that would be a good starting point. Now, I support for reasons that have come up in my argument that we deserve compensation for the fact that the commons has been privatized and more is, and, and the new stuff that gets created gets privatized. And they're finding new ways to, uh, you know, there might be a time when you got to buy clean air. Could be coming. Um, this, uh, cause they polluted the air. So you gotta, that's why you gotta buy water because you can't get it out of the stream because they polluted the stream. Now you got it. I was telling you to buy it, not the people who polluted the stream. Anyway, that's another story. So, um, so the, um, that for these reasons, I think what we owe each other is the highest sustainable basic income. Now, for that, you got to experiment with, well, what is the highest sustainable basic income? So I would, uh, um, and there's, there's only way to find out, the only way to find out is start raising it and see what the side effects are. So I would start out at something like Yang's level, maybe a little higher, and then gradually raise that and see if you get some significant negative side effects. If not, raise it a little bit. See when you start to get some side effects. And then maybe you think, okay, we got to slow down. If you're starting to get major side effects, then we slow down. That's the way I would go about it. If I was head of a long-term project of trying to figure out what kind of basic income we can afford. Start at the poverty line, work up. All right. Uh, yeah, Richard. Oh, and long-term, and probably it would be good to tie it to the, to the median wage. Um, to tie it or to the average or to per capita income so that once we find the level we want we fix it there so it's not going to be slowly eroded by inflation but it's also not going to spiral out of control or anything yeah. all right real quick Richard mm -hmm. um, what do you think about um, say the cor taking the opportunity provided by the coronavirus and um, seeing how uh, how do I say it? The and um, like what, like a disaster income, that kind of thing. And seeing how it, it can. Um, what what did you say again? Uh, so yeah, there's people talking about like providing people a disaster income to respond to. Yes, that's what I was saying on the. Yeah. Uh, and seeing how that could um, inspire people to um, use it to provide a an a, um a actual basic income. Yeah. Um. There are a lot of things like this. There are a lot of things like this. There, the the uh, one of the most famous disaster incomes I know of is that there was um, uh, there was a weather related disaster in I think what is it Tennessee where Dolly Parton is from. Dolly Parton is a hero of the basic income movement because Dolly Parton went and said, "Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna finance a uh, an unconditional amount of money for everybody who is in this disaster." And uh, this disaster income is, is pr proves very successful. It's a boost to the basic income movement. And I don't even know if uh, maybe Dolly Parton had, had known about this. Maybe she reinvented it the way Philippe Van Parijs did. I don't know. But uh, these kind of things, were, um, there's so many unlikely things like that. George Bush, uh, George W. Bush, during a recession in the early 2000s, gave everybody uh, a tax rebate of uh, a few hundred dollars to try to stimulate the economy, and that worked. There's all these unlikely things from a disaster income here to casino dividends that uh, that 
Indian tribes are giving to all their membership, and people are now starting to research those and see what that is doing for uh, poverty in these Indian communities. I mean, it's, and it's 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 <laughs> has good things and, and bad things about it um, because some Indian tribes are getting it, some aren't, and it's all based on where you're located and what the laws are there. But all these different pieces of evidence combined with, say, uh, some reform in Brazil, it's like basic income. Uh, all these different things are coming out, but providing more and more evidence that the fewer the conditions, the more universal the policy, the more it helps people. Um, and that, I think, is the best thing for the long-term growth in this movement, is that all this evidence, is we get little pieces of evidence, any little thing like that disaster dividend that you might get from cor the coronavirus, like you're talking about, that provides another piece of the puzzle. All right, Carl Waterquist, everyone. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much.